There is never a dull moment in South Africa. And uh, just when we thought that our biggest problem could be the national health insurance or load shedding from Eskom or the collapse of Transnet, along comes uh, evidence that there's been huge problems in the national student funding NISFAS, which is there to help poor students. And it seems like uh, there's been some creative uh, work done with the funding and the man who's on top of it is none other than Arta's Wayne Divinage. Wayne, welcome back to the State of the Nation. Nice to be with you, Mark. Thanks. <clears throat> so the year kicked off with a bang, just uh, when we thought our problems were going to be some of the things we discussed towards the end of last year, being Eskom, mm -hmm. doing interesting deals, NHI bill mm -hmm. being passed, <clears throat> nuclear, energy. nuclear energy, car power ships, all the usual mm -hmm. uh, suspects. Along comes uh, NISFAS. Do you want to explain to people yeah. what's happened there? <clears throat> so, thanks. Uh, um, it's a project we've been working on for some time. Rudy Haneke, who heads up our investigations department, very involved in this. He reports into Stefani, uh, who looks after our accountability division. And really, this one goes back quite far. And we've uncovered quite a few things, but they don't always make headlines. The services seater as far back as 2017, we picked up some big irregularities through input from uh, whistleblowers, paying you know, 500 times the amount for T-shirts, the same yeah. old typical stuff. Uh, and, 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 and we eventually exposed this to services CETA who then realized they've got to stop doing business with these service providers. Then uh, Andile Nongogo, the CEO of services CETA at the time, had moved on. And he resurfaced at NSFAS as the CEO of NSFAS. And lo and behold, we start hearing that the same people, different company names, same directors, same individuals, uh, are now involved in doing business at NSFAS. And we start getting information from whistleblowers. Same modus operandi, tenders stopped, re-tender, and tenders manipulated to suit service providers. In this case, in NSFAS over a year ago, we saw the whole scheme, the finance aid scheme, being managed, got to be managed through proper processes. And Paul, you pay uh, the money into the bank accounts of the individuals. That's how you get it to them. Uh, in the past, it was paid to universities uh, on behalf of the 10,000 students or whatever that were went to the university. Now, NSFAS says, look, we're going to manage it this way. Students apply, they, and the money goes into their accounts. Now, the middle people that manage that process, the service providers, can make a lot of money, a lot of money. In fact, the plan was that the first tender, as I say, was closed. Then the, suddenly this is awarded to four different companies. All those details on, on the, in the report on our website. And these four uh, companies, out of the 1,400 rand per month per student, were going to suck 100 rand out of the system. But the tenders, the initial tenders, and the other service providers were only going to charge uh, less than 10 times that, uh, 10 or 12 rand a month. That's the fee, the bank fee, the administration fee. Now you start to get the picture. So the student loses 100 rand instead of 10 rand or 12 rand. And there's a lot of money to be made there. So we started asking questions. Suddenly those amounts and fees changed. They started coming down. And we got more and more information and we brought this to NESFAS's attention that this is manipulative stuff. The CEO's involved. And by the way, the same CEO's been involved in this type of corruption, that type of corruption. We're seeing that there's concerns around the big office space uh, that they went into long-term rentals for, which they didn't have to go into. And you start coloring in this picture, and they ignored us. And they fobbed us off. And eventually the heat got too hot, and the minister said, Brooke, we've looked into this. This is June last year, June, July. And Andile Nongogo this year, we found nothing wrong. He's fine. Well, lo and behold, the heat gets too hot the, to the extent that the, uh, uh, they decide they're going to go and get an uh, independent uh, um, investigation by a legal firm. Worksman's does investigation. Using a lot of our input, by the way, from our report, Andile Nongogo gets fired. So it wasn't all kosher, Mr. Minister and, and uh, Chairperson of NSFAS. Uh, there's something seriously wrong here. And you've now fired him. And you've said you're going to uh, enact the uh, worksman's report, which was also get rid of those four service providers. 
And they said they were going to do that. Now, this was in October last year. We now sit going into the new academic year. They haven't got rid of these service providers who are still making good money out of the system, by the way, who have, got, who have dropped the ball. A lot of students didn't get their money. There have been so many administrative issues, and we raised these concerns with them because the companies that we could see where we were given these contracts were not fit for purpose. They were new. They were being set up. They were trying to integrate systems. Whereas the way these things are managed through well, um, you know, set up service providers and the banking systems, it's quick, it's easy, it's painless. It's, they've got all the systems in place. So this was manipulating to, to favor individuals. Then lo and behold, we start realizing something bigger is wrong here. You get rid of one person, but there are other issues. And then whistleblowers start giving us more information. And we start to say, but it looks like the Ernest Causa, the chairperson of NSFAS, is involved. And then we get recordings of discussions which corroborate that. In other words, here you have a chairperson of a big department in, in the Department of Higher Education, Science and Innovation that is having meetings with service providers or people closely connected to service providers, not meetings about their service issues and, and having a formalized, minuted discussion, Meetings in a restaurant with service providers talking about how do we get around these challenges. Uh, and if you go and listen to the recordings, it implicates that the chairperson is very, very involved with stuff that he shouldn't be. shouldn't be having discussions. It's just taboo. You don't do that. At governance processes, there's a massive conflict of interest. So what happens? A couple of weeks later, this is all out there. The minister comes on on, on to his conference, uh, media con And by the way, we put out our reports on the recordings, by the way, Mark. So all we did was took these recordings, no noisy background. We had to dampen out the background noise using technology. We had to listen carefully to the conversations, work out who's conversing with who. And we got the second one, similar discussions taking place, different, uh, another person involved. And we start putting two and two together with what we get from the whistleblowers and what our investigation is starting to show. And we see there's, there's nefarious activity here, serious nefarious activity. So we, uh, we compile a report and we say it as it is. We're not the media. We don't have to go and say, guys, you know, give us a response back. And by the way, when we do engage with the authorities, they ignore us. And then in as fast as. Uh, and, and don't come back to us. So we say, well, we're going to put out our statement. Let the media ask them the questions. They do a great job of that, which they did. And uh, and two or three weeks later, uh, uh, Bladen Zamundi, the minister, uh, comes on board and says, uh, uh, into his conference, media conference, says, oh, no, 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 I didn't. So, so one of the accusations that comes out of the recordings, no, we're not we accusing, we're saying this is what the recordings are saying, is that is that money from one of the service providers, money and or services to the uh, tune of about a million rand, was uh, provided to the SA Communist Party, SACP. Uh, so Bladen's Monday comes and I never took money from my departments and paid the SACP. We never said that, Blade. What we're saying and what we're picking up in these recordings is that the service providers who Ernest Causa is having conversations with, they reminded Ernest Causa, by the way, don't forget, that we, you know, the 2022, the SACP had a conference and they needed bags and this printed and a few things done and we provided that for them to the tune of a million rand. Now, what is that conversation? Now, where does Blade fit in? Well, he's the uh, president of the uh, SA Communist Party, he was for a long time the Secretary General. So there's a big connection there. So we're saying, how is this possible and, and can you explain this, Minister? So he comes and defends himself and, and twists the story like we said we paid money. He didn't, we didn't say that. Secondly, um, what we're asking him to do is to do some serious investigations into his own chairperson, maybe ask him to step aside while this happens, or maybe dismiss him if you find. Well, shortly after that, the chairperson said of his own volition, I, I'm going to ask to take leave of absence while you guys do this. Well, that's the beginning of the end of him, because if I was in his shoes and I was absolutely innocent, say, guys, there's nothing on me. But there's enough on him because he's also listened to those recordings. You, you, I would never keep anybody employed in an organization mm. that was having discussions like that with a service provider. So um, he's gracefully stepped aside. They've got a new acting uh, chair. Great. Uh, hopefully he does the right stuff and starts looking into this, uh, into this matter. 
Uh, but we're still asking questions of the minister. And the minister in that conference goes off on lots of tangents about how good they are trying to distract the issue. But he says, well, I've got my lawyers looking into this and uh, we're going to take legal advice on whether we should sue out. Well, that's fine. That's your right, minister. It's your prerogative if you want to. By all means, do that. Just know that when we do these reports, when we do this type of investigation, we don't do so flippantly. We've put our documents out there. And uh, uh, now it's up to the police, it's up to SARS, it's up to the public protector, and we are engaging with all of them, giving this information, giving affidavits uh, to the effect that they need this information with all the uh, uh, annexures so that they can go and do their work. And hopefully they do it well. But what we can say with confidence is that, you know, as a civil uh, you know, a society organization that tackles maladministration corruption. This is a classic case of doing great work with whistleblowers, protecting them, making sense of all this information, not shooting from the hip, going the long yards. As I said, 2017, we started following and dealing on Gogo and seeing this, uh, uh, this pattern. And uh, as much as the authorities want to fob us off, we're not going to be fobbed off and we're not going to ignore it. So we keep the pressure on. The narrative and the heat got so hot in the kitchen that things have happened. We didn't have to fire Andile Nongovo. They did. We didn't have to remove uh, Ernest Causa, the chairperson, that's us. He's stepped aside, but the heat is just too hot. And that same heat just keeps going up. Yes. And it will stop at the innocent people but it will burn through the uh, guilty parties. Well, that's uh, tremendous work that you've done. And to wrap it all up, you know, with a neat little bow on top uh, with all of the evidence is great. But uh, to, I'm sure everybody watching and everybody that I'm sure you bump into or have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, around the dinner table must ask you the same thing. If it is such an easy win, mm -hmm. right? Oh, not a win, such an easy loss for the country, we can see exactly who the guilty people are. What takes so long for the authorities to act? Political interference, lack of political will. And sadly, just before I forget this, let's come back to the crux of the matter. The, the students suffer the most. The yeah. poorest of the poor, these are poor students who cannot afford it. So in NSFAS, the funding uh, finance aid scheme is a good scheme. It's nothing wrong with that. Countries around the world help those, especially in our country where the, the, where the poverty levels are so high, where the inequalities are, we have to do this. We have to do it properly. But you can imagine that if you stop, start dropping those balls, how it impacts on individuals' lives. Right now, I can tell you, Mark, there are students now entering into the TVET colleges, which start earlier. They are sleeping on the pavements. They're sleeping in libraries. They are... They are struggling to find the accommodation that they are promised that they're supposed to be provided for in the scheme. So, And the same thing last year. There, there, there's been so many hiccups. So the people that suffer uh, are the students. And the money to be made is too big for the people who are connected to look away. So that that the one issue was on the tuition fees. That's the big thing. The next issue, which we started uncovering, the report was put out last year, at the end of last year, is the accommodation sector. What NSFAS are trying to do there as well is say, okay, not only in the accommodation, we're going to run a new portal and all new accommodation service providers, you have to apply to us, you have to be accredited and vetted. Now, this was done by the universities before. Now, NSFAS wants their cut and they take 100 rand, a registration fee, 5%. Now, you take 5% out of, out of the accommodation sector's fees. You know, where does that go to? Is it going to the service providers? Because that equates to 600 million rand, which was never paid by the service providers, uh, the accommodation people before. Now, somebody, either NSFAS and or the service providers are suddenly who are going to manage this platform are getting 600 million rand. For what? For what? You can build those platforms for a couple of million, put it in place and manage it very quickly. So we are now smelling a big rat there. And by October last year, for this year's intake on accommodation, they had, to, they had to verify thousands of rooms of accommodation. They've only done 6% of it, 67% of it we found. And now we're getting calls from service providers saying, we've got students that are coming here and, 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 and we can't let them in the door because we've applied for accreditation, we've paid our fees into this new scheme that NSFAS won, but they haven't accredited us. 
and and they've got people running around as accreditors, not trained, not the right people for accreditations. Like when you do a star grading of a hotel, you've got to know exactly what you're looking for. So, that, you know, those things are just coming and the students are going to have a tough time again this year as a result of all this meddling and these nefarious intent activities that are taking place. Why isn't this being done? Why isn't this being sorted out? Well, you have a minister of a department of higher education, and which, by the way, is fraught in many other areas. In insurance CETA, in CETA, corruption, not corruption CETA, although maybe there should be one, uh, construction CETA, services CETA, and it goes on. All these boards have people specifically placed there, and they start manipulating this because there's a lot of money in this uh, sectoral education training authorities as well. That's where our skills mm. development levies mm. go. So these are big pots of money, big pots. And uh, you would want this to work seamlessly, efficiently, and, and, and no waste, no ghost students, no uh, wasting of, of taxpayers' money. But it's not the case, unfortunately. Where does the buck stop? It stops with the minister. And when the minister is fed reports from civil society like ourselves, I mean, I would have expected, because this is quite serious, I would have expected his PA or himself or, or even the chairperson of, of, of services, I mean, of, of NSFAS, to contact us and say, hey, guys, you're making serious allegations, yeah? We don't know about this stuff. Can you help us? Can we send our investigations team in? We need to get to the bottom of this and wipe out any corruption that, that's there. Well, it didn't happen. Why not? The other not interested, the other involved, um, or, or there's some other issues uh, behind the scheme. So to me, it's everything has got to do with political meddling, and, and there's an agenda here, Mark. And the last bit I want to say is we don't see this just there. This is the modus operandi that is taking place at local government, provincial government, and national around the country, and it's got worse over the last few years. So I can understand uh, the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of easy to say political meddling stops the investigation. Uh, but here you're talking about one particular uh, uh, ministry hmm. influencing a different ministry. There's got to be a connection here between the Ministry of Higher Education, mm -hmm. who have got a case to answer, mm -hmm. a legal case, and the Justice Department. Well, I think they, they, they're doing their work. What we can say is that uh, we do have uh, um, contacts are being made with us now uh, uh, from the Hawks to get on top of this issue. Remember, the DA have also laid a case using our report, uh, but it's, there's not enough there. So we are engaging with authorities. We believe uh, the Hawks is taking this seriously. So this is only now in the last week or so. And that's fine. Um, and uh, look, the public protectors, another department, they will they will get our information as well. I mean, there's so much happening, so we're still getting to. We're going to furnish information to SARS. But I think they're also looking at our reports and, and, and moving ahead. So I don't necessarily uh, want to say that the, the, the Justice Department or the NPA and those aren't, aren't doing anything. I think they are, and they're going to. Now let's see. When I say this political meddling, I say the investigations that should have happened at the ministerial level. So if I was the minister, and I read about this in the media as far back as middle of last year, when he said, oh, we did our investigations and we found nothing wrong with Andile Nongogo. Oh, we said, really? Because how did you do those investigations? You didn't contact us. We were the ones making the claims. If you did it properly, your investigators, whoever you appointed, would have got hold of us, but they didn't. So what investigations, Minister? That's the political meddling that I'm talking about. Eventually, they got Worksman's Independent, who did a good report, by the way, Worksman's made all the recommendations to get rid of this CEO, get rid of the service providers, which they haven't carried out that report, even though the minister said very shortly, this is a number of months ago, we will have dealt with that report and carried out all the recommendations. Well, they still haven't. So he's, he's again, something's wrong. So have you seen proof of life of Shamila Batoy? Is she around? Is she being held hostage somewhere? Uh, you know, uh, Choleka, Choleka, is she around? Um, or are they only responsive to political cases? Well, you see, um, they, they, the public prosecutor uh, will, will start prosecuting when, A, they've got the evidence, 
Um, they could get a lot of that in, in our report. Remember, our report is of recordings and that we've got a number of indications, but we can only go so far. They can go a lot further. They can subpoena bank records and that. So they haven't contacted us, uh, but I'm sure once the Hawks case is uh, uh, lodged now, and uh, which is being done, and uh, and the affidavits are all signed, and then those will find their way into the prosecution process, and they'll pick up the ball there. So they can't sort of run ahead of the cart, so to speak. I'm sure it's unfolding. I'm not making excuses for them. They were far behind on so many other matters. Mm. Uh, we would love to have seen uh, a lot of the other cases the, from the Zonda report and all that advanced a lot further. So let's see what happens. Considering that the Zonda Commission report has been sitting on their desk for months, for years, um, without yeah. any action. So you know, Mark, it's just telling you something about the something's, priorities. Something's, yeah, and, and look, they are under capacity. Again, not making excuses. They're hollowed out. Uh, we see they are under massive strain. Uh, but that's their problem and not ours. Our frustration is, 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 is I think government's got its priorities wrong. And we, that's the big crux of the matter. For instance, how does the VIP protection unit for the ministers and that get an increase in the last uh, budget announcements? But the National Prosecuting Authority and Independent uh, director, Investigative Directorate doesn't. Uh, and they get cut. Yeah, I Our think view is that they should be capacitated. We've said it on record a few times. Give the NPA with the right processes behind it to make it supercharged. Give them ten billion because they will give you back as a country a hundred billion. Yeah, uh, and, and so they're going to give themselves a little bit more protection. Yeah, way. I think uh, I think you're making a, a terrible sort of schoolboy error, if I may say so, mm-hmm. Wayne. And that is that uh, they've got their priorities exactly right with the way they for want themselves, them. yeah. right? And that is. Uh, that you give yourself, uh, you know, you pay yourself first. Wow. You get yourself for, uh, you pay know, your party protection. first. You pay your party first. Pay your interests and agendas yeah, first. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, more that's, cabinet ministers, more that's this, more exactly that. Exactly the problem. But Wayne, now there's uh, there's there's been a big announcement uh, in higher education. Suddenly, NISFAS is going to be providing some cover for the so-called middle middle mm-hmm. missing yeah. middle. Yeah. Is this just part of the uh, of the cover that they are uh, trying to get the story out of the news with something good? Or how do you read that? No, uh, look, that's been something that's been on their cards for some time. So it is a little bit opportune that it comes out now and they make these announcements, possibly not only to deflect it, but it is long overdue, by the way. Why hadn't they done this last year? So suddenly the uh, minister's making some uh, other good announcements. I'm sure he's going to come with some other nice good announcements, as he did at his press conference about what they're doing here and there. Well, this is what we expect you to do. There's nothing mm. really hero- heroic. We expect you to do all the good things that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but we also expect you to manage the fallout, the problems, which they're not uh, doing as well as they should do. So, um, yeah, I think he's obfuscating and, and backpedaling. I think this minister, you know, if you compare what Blade and Zamandi is undergoing now to uh, what um, the Minister of Health, um, Kize, went through on the Digital Vibes issue mm. a year and a half ago or so, not much difference here. Yeah, although there is. He hasn't been found guilty mm-hmm. then. Well, neither has Blade yet, but, yeah. but where this smoke is thick. Yes, there's something wrong. Yeah, there's a there's ob- there's obviously a massive difference between uh, the position of uh, William Kize when he was Minister of Health versus played in Zimbabwe now, and that is that the one wasn't going to challenge the other the <coughs> president for you know for the role of presidency mm. in the next elective conference. So quite clearly, yeah, the pressure possibly. was on to get rid of uh, of one of your competitors. Mm. But uh, Wayne, you know, we we obviously heading towards elections now, and and you know um, the ANC, you know, has been on the ropes. But lots of money is going amiss here. When I mean mm. to read that list of uh, of expenses, you know, paying thousands of rand for a t-shirt, etc., mm. etc. Is there anybody here who should who should be going to jail? Well. What should be happening, Mark, is that the authorities should be following through on every one of these things. So right going back to 2017 on the Grace and Reed contract where we exposed all of this stuff, the prosecuting authorities need to get all the facts, go and get all subpoena the bank records, join the dots, follow the money, and start laying charges. Those haven't happened yet. We've laid cases against many people, against the the, uh, the deputy president, uh, Mabuza, a little while ago, uh, based on a lot of stuff that's come out on another case. 
and so the list goes on. There's there's lots of them uh, who are walking the streets freely, and then the next level down and the next level down. Who should do this? I mean, ultimately, what you're saying is, it doesn't ha- help that that Andile Nongogo just resigns yeah. and gets away. Yeah, and he needs to be investigated with a couple of hundred million rand in the bank yeah. in his yeah. bank account. Yeah. I'm sure, and his assets attached. Uh, so, so SARS has a role to play. Lifestyle audits, um, investigations, NPA, and the whole book thrown at him, and the companies that were involved in all these deals. All of them, those directors, those companies should be on the on the uh, the list. So the government can't do business with them, and the directors. I mean, there's so many that I found wanting are still doing business with government. So, our criminal justice system is lacking the ability to move at the pace it should be. In a country where the rule of law is applied and, and efficiently and promptly, uh, those, all of those people, all those cases uh, would have been through the courts and if they were guilty, in jail. Right now. Yeah. But they're not. Now, I know that you're, you, you're, you know, you've, you've had a lot to do with the, with the legal system, the, you know, the justice system in South Africa. I'm, I'm quite confused by this argument about lack of capacity. Because I, as I've followed the development of Outer, you guys have almost been the poster child of limited resources, right? <laughs> and when you've got limited resources, as all of us have in our businesses one way or another, mm. you kind of go after the, the, the low-hanging fruit, the job you can complete, and you complete the job. Otherwise, you don't get paid in the morning, mm. right? Uh, why can do you perhaps have an understanding as to why if you know Shamila Batoy who's got the best sad face I've seen ever you know other than my Labrador who looks at me with a real sad face looking for another treat she really does do sad face very well why can't the prosecuting authorities go after one winnable case and win it well there are there have been some successes, and you've got ACE, although these court cases drag out because of the interlocutory challenges. This is all the Stalingrad tactics that these guys bring. Um, Molefia, I think there are cases against them. So it's not that none are happening, but yes, no one's in jail yet. We want to see some high-profile people in jail. Remember, mm. Jacob Zuma uh, was in jail. Yes, he should have stayed there longer than that, but that was a different matter. It was a mm. con-, con court issue. So let's come back to, again, no excuses yeah. Every day there's rape, there's murder, there's, there's corruption, there's so much happening that all the, these entities are dealing with. And on top of that, they're dealing with a 10-year backlog when Jacob Zuma came into power and put the brakes on and put Sean Abrams and all these people into these positions that just stopped everything. So now you've got to release that break and get 10 years of work on top of every day-to-day crime. So what should happen, which isn't happening, and this comes back to the political right from the top, because if you put in all the resources, if you said, if, you, if I was the president and, and I said, we are seriously going to deal with corruption, maladministration, it's a whole process, uh, but it starts at the top and it says no more. This is how we're going to do it. Put in place all the mechanisms. We're going to supercharge the uh, national prosecuting authorities. We don't have enough money. We're going to call for international help. I can tell you the international community will run in because they want to see democracy work and they want to help where, where, where there are governments that say help us with our democracy. And one of those elements and it's in the, uh, uh, the whole um, sustainability development goals is dealing with corruption. They will come to our aid. They will give us the extra 10 billion rand we need. I promise you. Uh, you know, $500, $600 million, that will come if we ask for that help, not even with interest and loans and that. Because when we start fixing South Africa, we start fixing an important component in Africa and an important country in the world. Uh, but that's not happening. So the, 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 the through the finance structures and schemes, are oh, we doing a bit? We've appointed Shami Lebatoy and not saying whether she's good or bad. Maybe she could have better leadership skills or support, but she's also struggling with maybe all of that. And the and there's so many people that have been planted in the Zuma days that put barriers in place. Again, no excuses. That's their problem. They must get on top of it and they must shout louder for the money. We can also shout louder to the present, which is what we do. And uh, and in every budget speech, we say, where is the funds, the additional funds we need to fight corruption? That's the problem in this country. Our president 
And the people in positions of authority are not taking the fight against corruption seriously. It's all lip service. Why not? Well, the big answer to that is there are many people in positions of power still to this day and recently and that are connected to the ruling party that if the rule of law flowed and efficiently, well, they would all go to jail. Or many of them, not all, I don't want to generalize, many of them would be found wanting. That's not good for politics, not good for a ruling party. Can you imagine headlines uh, every week? Another ANC official, another ANC senior uh, person in authority is now implicated, charged, and in court, and oh, in orange overalls. That doesn't look good for a party that's trying to win the next elections. Well, you know, we do have a general election coming up, and it... Uh, it it could be mighty interesting, um, you know, if if the pollsters are correct and the ANC goes below 50% uh, and they have to, uh, you know, put together a coalition and become a little bit more answerable. We've mm. seen that in some of the coalition. I know that uh, the president is quick to say their coalitions have failed, but one of the things that the coalitions tend to do is to instill just a little bit more accountability than what we have at the moment. Well, it changes the dynamics. And let's also point out to the president that there are about 40 different coalitions, uh, governments, mainly at the local government level, all of them, uh, and only about six or so aren't working. Now, granted, they're the big ones, the city of Joburg and, and, and places like that. But many are working and many, as you just said, the dynamics change. There's more accountability. There's a different uh, speaker and a diff so the, so. They work this process out. And we are get, coming to grips with coalition politics. So we don't have years and years of a history of experience of this. So we're going to have to go through the pain and we're going to have to learn. Uh, and, we, and citizens now have to start adding more pressure. For instance, in the city of Joburg, there's a Joburg Crisis Committee uh, that is putting pressure on the, on the political elements to, you know, otherwise we start getting frustrated and we start talking about, do you want to tax so well? Do you want to not work with us or not? This is this whole development of a co-governance with civil society, especially at local government level, is now starting to unfold. What does that look like? You know, do water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, be managed by separate entities outside of the local municipality? You just can't manage these things, which is why we have sewage and our rivers are are just becoming cesspools. And and working with national government in those areas, new laws are being written so that we can introduce special purpose vehicles to to manage our cities better because the competence has dissipated. And the political will, again. Now, Wayne, you mentioned uh, those wonderful words that I'm sure a lot of people would uh, would be very excited to hear more about, and that is tax revolts. Okay. <laughs> now, we uh, to everybody that's that's watching this, South Africa recently had a bit of a its own version of a of a minor tax revolt down in down, Westville, down Westville in, in, uh, in the Etiquini municipality mm. metro. Yeah, it didn't work. Uh, why did it not work? So, <clears throat> I was always be careful not uh, when we talk tax revolts. A lot of people say, I'll oh, go tax revolt. So, you tax revolt at the national level, very different to tax revolt in the municipality. Um, and, and so, let's talk municipal tax revolts. Um, if you go the way that Westville went and you lose in court, it's just, you're going to lose those ones because they're not doing it properly. What you need to do is to demonstrate to a court you've done everything that you can, um, that you've engaged with the authorities, even though they're fobbing you off, that you've done one, two, and three, and on this basis, you would like to call for a, a, a redirection of the funds into a special purpose account, trust account, where you can start insisting that um, the right service providers are paid. So there's a plan there. Whereas the tax revolt is people stop paying and they're paid into some arbitrary account. Some guy says, okay, we'll open and, and, and it's not done properly. You want the court of law to approve this. So when you do that, and there's a number of uh, examples of where Sunny's offers the classic example, one of the first ones, where they went to court and the court ordered that the, the, uh, the rate payers could pay the money into a trust account, that the civil society entity that was set up could oversee what was happening there uh, to make sure the service providers were paid, the potholes are fixed, and the traffic lights. And that was done through properly, uh, and they tested in the court of law. Whereas these guys went ahead, they were then challenged in court by the, by the municipality, and the, and the municipality won. So if you're going to go into those processes, there's, there's, there's examples of how to do it. We'll be starting to set up some best practices. Uh, and, and, 
and again, courts have ruled in favor of communities and, and service providers to take away the functions of, in Costa, for instance, the water management system, because the municipality completely trashed it and the, and, the, and the citizens could prove that they hadn't done it and this was their plan. So courts says, That's, that makes sense. Do you not think that, a, that an organization like Outer, which is you know trying to roll that rock uphill of getting the government to keep the government mm. accountable, Right, which we understand, we've just discussed it, has no will to do. Do you not think that perhaps that a, a, an organization like Outer would get better traction in becoming a, a tax revolt organization? Well, again, you know, each case is so different um, that all we can do is provide advice, and even advice, you've got to be careful with that word, advice, um, input and best practice and say, you know, if you're a community, and we're dealing with a number of them around Grayton and, and, and others around the country, how do they ta tackle this? We, we always say gather the evidence, engage with the authorities as much as you can. Because when you get to court, you can demonstrate that we've been down this road, we've tried this, we've done that, and now we turn to you, the courts, to rule on how do we manage this? Because we can't keep paying our money, and there's the obvious waste and, uh, and, and trashing of our finances. And then the courts will ask you, well, what do you want? And you work with your lawyers and you prepare your case of what you seek. It's always going to be a temporary arrangement until there's the next election or until things get better. But every case is going to be different. So we, we don't want to say, well, come to us and we'll start a tax revolt for you. We can't do that. We also don't know the circumstances. We're also a small team. And we're also up to here. We're snowed under. So... So we've got our community action network team that empowers, helps residents associations and local communities to become more formalized and, and you know, websites and, and constitute yourself properly and then start gathering evidence. And this is how you do it. So we've got a little team that's working with uh, many, many ratepay associations in many towns around the country. That's, that's going to be our contribution and help in that regard. Uh, when it comes to national tax revolt, I've spoken about this quite a lot. It's a, it, emotionally, the knee-jerk reaction is, yes, let's start a tax revolt. There's two issues with it. First of all, be careful for what you wish for. Because if you, the first thing you've got to do is get business on board. We're talking about big business. Business pays PAYE over. Business pays the VAT. You don't get that money. Uh, it doesn't just say, oh, well, I'm not going to, you don't go to your boss and say, don't pay my PAYE, on a, I'm on a tax revolt. Mm. <laughs> they, they can't do that. Mm. Uh, you can't unless, go to you, a shop. unless you're the ANC, <laughs> yeah. in which case you can do yeah. it. You don't go to a shop and say, I want to buy this, but I'm not paying the VAT. I'm on a tax mm. revolt. You, know, I think this is all, you can't have it. Mm. So, so if you don't get big business on board, and they won't come. They won't come. The, the They're second, supporting the ANC at well, the moment. Well, it's just that, it's just that this is so big. I mean, if you could pull that off, that would be the first hurdle, let's say. Second hurdle is um, if you do that, let's say you could pull it off. Well, then what? So who's going to run the country? Because the, the first month that the police, the hospitals, the border controls, the SARS, the first month that nobody's paid, so they're down tools. Now your country comes to a grinding halt. And now what? Are you going to pay the police? Who's going to pay the it doesn't work. So, so then you have chaos, then you, and you can't undo this. You have absolute chaos. You have a you have a country that goes into meltdown. So, let's not talk tax laws because it's not a practical and b it's almost impossible to pull off. Let's talk about how you apply pressures through the democratic processes, through the stuff that not only ourselves, many NGOs and civil society organisations are doing. Uh, and just keep up the pressure. We have an election. This is what democracy is all about. Five years. Here it is, six months away. We could see things very differently in six months' time. Who knows what that coalition looks like? I think the ANC will get below 50%, well below. New parties, independent candidates, rulings, which changed the landscape a little bit there. But, but we're in for a very interesting time. Let's just get out of this... One notion that, oh, I don't like what I see out there, therefore I'm not going to vote. That's the weakest excuse. We always say, then vote for the least bad. Apply your mind. Because if everybody stays away, well, you have the status quo. And then don't complain. Mm -hmm. If you don't vote, 
This is my message to people. If you don't vote in May, you've got no room to promote. Even though, even though if you thought you'd voted the, for that party and they didn't get in and things didn't change, say, oh, well, you see nothing change. That's an excuse. If everyone had that excuse, we have a problem. If you don't vote, you cannot complain. You should never complain. You must accept the status quo. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Ringing endorsement for something we've been saying all along. We've got a wonderful opportunity ahead of us later this year. I can't reiterate enough what Wayne had to say about uh, the, the, ne the, the need for everybody to go out and vote. 2024 has given us all an opportunity. If we're not happy with the way things are, then vote. If you choose, if you are happier the way things are, then stay at home or vote for the ANC if you're happier the way things are. But you've probably heard enough compelling evidence today to make you at least consider an alternative. Go out there, keep watching the state of the nation. We'll keep on bringing eminent people to come and explain the state of the nation. So subscribe so you get uh, notifications of our next uh, uh, speakers. But I'd like to thank uh, Wayne Divinage for coming through again. Wayne, thank you so much and a great conversation. And we look forward to seeing you again on the State of the Nation. Thanks, Wayne. Cheers. Thanks, Wayne.